sure But I wouldn't ask for more in you Say rest assured We were made for this We were made for this Call me out Ladies and gentlemen, family, it's great to see you all. Let's begin. The word love. Family, we are made for this word. And today we will look at three reasons why love really is the most excellent way. 1 Corinthians 13. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By all this, men will know that you are disciples if you love one another. John 13, 34 through 35. Family, let's love 
one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love God does not know God, because God is love. 1 John 4, 7 through 8. For anyone who does not love his brother, who he has been, cannot love God, who he has not seen. He has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. 1 John 4, 20. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, through the name of Jesus Christ, we want to thank you for this day. Father, thank you for the church service that we are having. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that is leading us. Father, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for each one of us who found time to be here. We call upon you to continue revealing yourself. Father God, I ask that you hide me behind the cross so that your words can be heard and not mine. Father God, thank you for your love and for your care. We pray believing in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Many years ago when I was a teenager, a song came out that went something like this. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. That's the only thing that there's just too little of. And then the song went on to list a lot of different things that we do not need any more of. And then it came back to its chorus, which told the world what it really needed. And the world needed love, sweet love. Because that was the one thing in the world that there was just too little of. If you were to study the book of 1 Corinthians, it would become readily apparent that love was exactly what the church of Corinth was lacking. Love is exactly what they desperately needed. The church of Corinth needed love, agape love. And that was the one thing that was just too little of. Paul, up to this point in his letter, has spent a great deal of time discussing divisions that were within the church. In chapters 11 through 14, Paul addresses some of the divisions that were happening in the church. It is within this discussion in chapter 13, sandwiched between chapter 12 and 14, that Paul gives the church in Corinth the solution of the problem of division. In chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about love. And this chapter is a favorite of many people and it's been read in many weddings. And it's really beautiful text to hear at a wedding. There's no other writing in all of literature that I know of that is as expressive and yet brief and to the point as to what love is. Paul, however, did not write this so that people would have something to read at weddings or so that he would have a handy definition of love. Rather, Paul included this in his letter in order to get the solution of the problem of division that was running rampant in the church of Corinth. In chapter 12, which we will study in detail today, Paul confronted the problem that the church in Corinth had with spiritual gifts. And everybody thought they were the most important, they were the most special part of the church. Everyone wanted to be greater than everyone else. And they were able to do anything and go anywhere to get there. Paul in chapter 13 is basically telling the Christians in the church, slow down, don't be so busy, relax and don't be in such a hurry. Running here and there to prove that you are better than everyone else. Just sit back and let me show you a more excellent way. And family, the more excellent way is the way of love. Today as we study chapter 13, we will discover the three reasons Paul gives as to why the way of love is the most excellent way. And as we examine this timeless instruction from the pen of the Apostle Paul, we will see three principles that will unfold before our eyes. And in response, we must be challenged to apply this most excellent way to our brothers, our sisters, our life, our home life. And if we do, family, we will destroy division and uplift unity in our homes and church. Family wise, love the most excellent way. Because one, love is essential. Family is what we are made for. So how many of you have plants? Um, real plants, the kinds that undergo photosynthesis? I'm sure many of you do, and, and if you don't, I'm sure you have a basic understanding of the things that are necessary for one to do in order to take care of that plant. And I want you to imagine, imagine that you went to your local plant nursery and bought a plant, and everyone's imagining, right? You bought a spider plant or some other kind of house plant. And now you are in your car and you're smiling as you drive your plant home. And this plant is really special to you, so you give it the highest place of honor in your home. You put it in your living room and you give it the best view of the TV. 
and to even put the remote control in this little red pot. And throughout the day, you talk to your little new friend. You say all kinds of nice things to him. You even turn on the aerobic show on the TV and you exercise his sleeves. You read books about plants. You, you buy magazines about plants. You watch TV documentaries about plants. Every day you are consistently increasing your knowledge of plants. And you are sure that your plant has to be the luckiest, most happiest plant in the entire world. But something happens. A few months down the road, your plant begins to wilt. Its leaves turn brown. It begins to lean down. And you don't understand why. You don't understand why because you still talk to your plant as much as you ever did. You still turn on the morning workout videos every day, but you have noticed that this little heart doesn't seem to be into the workouts like it was before. Stay with me. And don't leave me yet. And one night, while you're eating popcorn and watching the award-winning PBS documentary How to Care for Your Little Green Friend, The House Plant, you look over and you notice that the plant is dead. How could this happen? You said all the so-called proper words. You read all the right books. You gave it a place of honor. You did morning workouts and you were even a member of the Happy House Plant Club. Tell me the problem is, is you did everything except what was most essential. You never watered your plant. Your little plant died of thirst. As I read 1 Corinthians again, you will see that what Paul is saying is that love is essential. In verse 1, Paul is saying that even if someone speaks in the language of men or of angels, if that person does not have love, he produces nothing. Family, the church of Corinth had many people who thought that the gifts of languages made them special. But Paul says that without love, their words rung hollow. They were empty. Love is essential. In verse 2, Paul says that even if a person has a great knowledge and a great faith that can move mountains, and there certainly were people in Corinth that were puffed up like a hot air balloon over their superior knowledge of supreme faith. But Paul said that if a person does not have love, he is nothing. Then in verse 3, Paul says that a person can give all he has to the poor, can surrender his body to the flames, which is probably a reference to dying for one's faith. But the things that we, that we do, the things that we say, the things that we know, the things that we give are important. It is love that really is essential in our church, in our home, in all of our relationships. For that, for that matter, let's, let's make sure that we don't get busy doing all of the urgent things, that, that we forget the one essential thing. And let's take the time to water each of the plants in our life because love really is essential. Love will help prevent the problem of divisions from even entering our homes, our churches in the first place. And on the occasion when there are problems in our church and in our home, it, it is love applied and love lived that will always restore those who are divided. Love is edifying. In verse four through seven, Paul defines for us what love is. Now, obviously the love mentioned here is agape love, the love of the will, the love seeking another's best, the love sacrificing for others. And as Paul very distinctly defines love, we can see that love is edifying, that love builds things up and holds things together. I sometimes like to visualize love as the spiritual cement that holds our home together. And the descriptions that Paul gives in verse four through seven of love are the recipe for the cement of love. So Paul in these verses not only tells us what must go into our cement, but Paul also tells us what must not go into our cement mixture. As we look at these ingredients, we will readily see that the church in Corinth had many of the prohibited ingredients in their cement mixture, and that they were also lacking many of the essential ingredients. It's also interesting to note here that if we look at the life and example of the Apostle Paul and, and of Christ, we will see that their mixture was right on target. As they lived their lives, we will see that both Paul and Jesus were living demonstrations of love. So we need to put in the following because family, love is patient. Love is patient and it puts up with people and their differences. Love suffers. 
Love waits. Love refuses to give in to anger and vindictiveness. Love waits for hope and repentance. Love is David with Saul, Barnabas with John Mark. Christ with his disciples. Christ with you and me. But there's a there's a saying that, that love is blind, but for family, that's really not true. Love is not blind, but love is kind. Love is considerate. Love does good to people, even when people are irritating you. While patience puts up with a lot, patience gives out a lot. While patience is self-restraint, kindness is self-expression. And we love is protection. The word used here means to protect or preserve by covering, and it's the same word used for the roof of a building. The purpose of the roof is to protect the contents of the building. Love is willing to do that for people, to act as a shield, to protect them from damaging winds, uh, problems that may try to hurt them. Love provides a place of safety and a shelter where a person can find refuge from the storms of life. My friends, love is trust. Love looks for the very best in everyone. Love gives the benefit of the doubt. Love takes people at their word and hopes for their trustworthiness as long as it can. It mourns over those who stumble and fall. Family love is when you've been disappointed in someone, someone you once believed in. Love always hopes for better things. Love hopes for repentance. Love is preserving. It lasts and it's not easily overcome. The seven things I just mentioned are what we must be certain is part of our cement of love. And now we need to make sure that certain things do not go into our cement of love and contaminate it and cause it to lose strength and the ability to hold things together. Love does not envy. Love does not begrudge the fortune of others. Only agape love can see all the inequalities of life and still remain content with its own place. Paul in chapter 4 of Philippians says that through Christ he was content in whatever situation he found himself in. Love does not boast. Love does not brag about itself. Love is not conceited. Many in Corinth were boasting about the gifts and abilities they had and that the others did not. Love is not proud. Love is not obsessed with self-importance. Love is not like the Pharisees who thank God that he was not like the tax collector. My friends, give a man a little earthly authority or position and, and one soon sees whether he has love or arrogance. Love is not rude. Love is courteous, tactful, polite, respectful. Love does not say I speak my mind, I'll say what I think without first asking will words hurt. Are they kind? Will they build up? Love is not self-seeking. Love is willing to sacrifice its interest for the welfare of others. There can never be true love with a me-first attitude. Love is not easily angered. Love does not fly into fits of temper. Love is not irritable. Greatness is not in position, but in disposition. If we have a problem with our temper, let's not just excuse it anymore. Love is not easily angered. Hey, here's a tough one. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not keep a scorecard of the wrong things done to it. Love does not hold a grudge. Love forgives and forgets. If we are keeping score for something someone did or said back in 1992, we are not practicing love. And family, I am sure glad that Jesus Christ did not keep a record of my wrongs. He has gracefully removed them as far as the East is from the West. Friends, love does not rejoice in evil. Love is never glad when others go wrong. Some get certain malicious pleasure in hearing of someone else's fall or trouble. Love does not do that. I think you would all agree that Paul has given us quite an exhaustive list of what love is. Now it's up to us, it's up to you, it's up to me to look at our own cement mixture and make sure we have the proper mix. If something is missing, let's put it in. If something is contaminating it, let's get it out. 
Can you imagine the impact of that love as Paul describes? If it were here in our homes, in our government, in our church, in our families, it would be absolutely incredible. Love is enduring. And there is much debate today as to specifics of these verses. And today we're not going to spend our time getting wrapped up in those. I don't want to get bogged down by the specifics and miss the main point. Miss the big picture. And that big picture is found in verses 8 through 13. Love endures. Love leaves a permanent mark on our lives. People may not remember the great Bible lesson you taught, the beautiful song you sang, or the program you planned. Now don't think that I'm saying that these things are not important because they really are. But people will always remember the act of love that you shared, an ear you gave to listen to their heartache, a note to encourage them, a visit, forgiving them when they've done you wrong without making them grovel, the time you sacrificed for them. Friends, in doing acts of genuine love, we are storing up ourselves treasures in heaven, where dust and moth and rust cannot destroy. And most importantly, we will be building up the Church of Christ and making it stronger. We need to give love in our homes. And, and let me tell you something, it really is the most practical thing that we can give. It doesn't cost us anything. Family, it's permanent. Toys break, clothes wear out, flowers die, candy gets eaten, vacations come to an end. They may be remembered no more. But love lasts, love endures. Family, let's not forget to give our wives, husbands, children, family, brothers and sisters in Christ, and the church the essential thing that edifies and builds up. Let's give them a thing that endures forever. Let's give them love, which I'm sure you will agree by far is the most excellent thing. The Bible commands. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. 1 John 3.11 From the beginning, from the very start, family, we were made for this. Let's pray. Father God, you are the author and originator of love. Father, we only know love because you are love and, and you loved us first, Father. Father God, you loved us specifically and sacrificially. Father, you loved us in our sin and our rebellion against you. Father, you loved us despite the pain we inflict on others. Father God, your love is in our mess. Father, it is that love, that selfless, self-sacrificing love, which allows us to love others. Father, it is an overflow of your love for us that allows us to have love for other people. Father God, we ask that you make us better lovers to one another. Father, would you give us the heart and love to proclaim your love to those who need to hear? Father God, I wanna lift up my friends. I want to lift up my family who have not yet seen their need for a Savior because they do not see their own sin. Father God, open their eyes to the hurt they cause you and others. Father God, open their hearts to the depth of their need for a saving. Father God, may they see that there is no one righteous, not even one. Father God, remove the scales from their eyes so that they can see. Father, so many of our friends and family feel condemned by the mistakes they've made and the sins that they've committed. Father God, some believe that there is no way God or anyone could really love them. Father God, we pray that you would help us to show the love of God to our brothers by withholding judgment and condemnation. Father God, we pray that through this love, your Holy Spirit would speak the words, you are forgiven, now go and sin no more. And Father God, help us to see that we are your love letters to a world desperate to be loved. Father, we ask that you show each of us that our stories are valuable to your kingdom and that you want to use us to spread your love to the ends of the earth. Father God, you have written the gospel love story on the tablets of our hearts and it's a story that needs to be shared. Father God, we pray for the courage and conviction to share our love letters with the world. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. And again, everyone, thank you so much for watching. Uh, please do remember to share this message. Um, I ask that you all be safe, God bless, love you, and have a Merry Christmas, thank you.